Good morning from Bali, everybody. Here it's it's eight o'clock in the morning for us, and we are doing our live Yoni Talks as we do every week. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm Adrian. I am the Yoni nutritionist, and I specialize in holistic nutrition and wellness for women's sexual health. And my name is Kristen Maria Lexi, and I'm from Yoni Licious, and I'm a sexologist, a women's wisdom educator, and feminine embodiment coach. And today we are going to talk about fertility and contraception. Um, our topic last week was on, on elective abortion and it was this kind of made sense for us to go into fertility and contraception today. So I'm going to talk first, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So well yeah, do you wanna just kinda of highlight like what you'll what talk, we'll about talk about and what yeah. I'll talk about and then Yeah. So today I'm going to talk about um, fertility, about how to increase fertility, how to be aware of our fertility, um, and then all different methods of contraception. Um, and then Adrian. I'm going to talk about um, natural ways that you can improve and increase your fertility and contraception with food. Yeah. So the foods that help promote fertility Amazing. and contraception. Naturally. Amazing. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. So, uh, to begin with fertility, um, you know, this is something that we should be taught as soon as we become fertile. Um, however, it's really greatly left out of our education system and, and out of the birds and the bees talk. Um, but our body pretty much tells us when we're fertile. And um, this knowledge is so powerful um, that our body has all of the answers that we need in our um, in our menstrual cycle for all aspects of our of our womanhood, um, how we're feeling, how we how we're going to feel in certain phases of our cycle, and um, yeah, and when we're fertile. So fertility is um, when you are able to conceive a child when. Um, there's a window open for um, the sperm to meet the egg and um, for conception to occur. And it, when we ovulate, that's when we that's that's called ovulation. It's when we when we are fertile. Well, when we're fertile, there's a window of about seven days. But when we ovulate, that's when the um, when we when we can become pregnant. And that lasts for about twelve to forty eight hours. So. Um, even though we're only technically fertile in our body for 12 to 48 hours, um, it also depends on how long the sperm can survive, which can be up to seven days, some studies say 10 days. So in reality, we are fertile for around seven to 10 days, um, even though we only ovulate for 12 to 48 hours. If the sperm is inside us, five days beforehand and it's and it's staying alive then we're actually still fertile then um, also because the nectar that is secreted is more um, friendly to a sperm than post ovulation so what I mean about the nectar it's called um, in technical terms the cervical mucus um, it, we also use the term discharge I know when I was little I had no idea what that was I was about 10 years old and my mum was like well, maybe 11 my mom was like, you're washing your own undies from now on. And I was like, oh my God, okay, that stuff I found in my undies was, there's something fucking wrong with me. Um, and I was so embarrassed and ashamed about this like magical stuff that was coming out of my yoni telling me really important information about my body. And so um, I, re I remember going to my friend's houses like as the years went by and like checking their underwear to see um, if, if they also had the same stuff in their underwear and finding it and be like, okay, so she's got it as well. Maybe you I, did. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, maybe there's not something wrong with me. Um, but I was still super ashamed, like so ashamed. Um, yeah, when in fact this is really important information from our body. So once we finish bleeding up until ovulation, that's the window where we have to be careful. Um, we finish bleeding and then we're, quite, we're often um, our cervical mucus or nectar is it's quite dry and then watery. So um, there isn't a, a whole heap for, I mean, for sisters that are naturally quite juicy, there might be more, but 
um, generally it's dry to watery um, and this is going off a regular cycle obviously this um, there's variations in cycles and um, exceptions but generally speaking this is how the menstrual cycle goes um, and then we have a watery consistency and the sperm can survive in that and kind of swim through that easier then once we ovulate there's a little cap that comes off our cervix there's um, and then our cervical fluid is like egg white and can be quite like gooey um, and that's when we're, we're really fertile and makes it really easy for the sperm to swim through the egg is being released from the ovary and there's about 12 to 48 hours where it, it is um, it's able to become fertilized by a sperm and um, yeah so that's pretty much how that goes and once we're finished ovulating our cervical mucus will change to like a creamy like toothpaste consistency and then it would change to like a clag glue like consistency um, and the, the, there we have the most valuable information for our fertility ever um, that being said people who are having irregular cycles or some people have a double double ovulation sisters do usually when you have the moon in the sign that you were born in so my, my moon is in Scorpio so when moon, the moon is in Scorpio I'm extra careful I'm just making I'm checking my cervical uh, nectar more frequently I'm not just kind of relying on how I know my, my cycle usually goes um, so yeah we have a bit of an, uh, an epidemic at the moment with infertility um, some studies show one in three couples are having issues conceiving other studies say three in seven which is so sort of much of a muchness or yeah and um, a huge contribution to that contributing factors are um, poor diet um, exposure to xenoestrogens um, sisters who aren't aroused while while making love um, low sperm count um, which is also attributed to um, exposure to xenoestrogens and poor diet so it's um yeah it's a it's a big problem and it, and it's really yeah can i add something yes. to that i'm sorry to interrupt that's but okay we were we've also been talking a lot about being careful about putting our cell phones close to our uterus yeah um because of the effects of radiation as well from the wi-fi totally and cell phone signals yeah because i think that's also that yeah. also contributes to it yeah for sure and, and for men too they've got their phone in their pocket I mean, the thing is, sperm is constantly regenerating, but, um, you know, if, if it, because the, the, the testicles have to be at a certain temperature for the sperm to survive, and so that's why <coughs> they get lower when men are hot, to get away from the body to stay to, at a healthy temperature, and, and when it's cold, up closer to the body, and then if there's a cell phone and, like, extra heat, and there's no way for the body to naturally respond to that because it's not used to it, then the, the sperm health isn't optimal either. So yeah, definitely keeping phone and computer away from the pelvic region and genitals. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so yeah, there's there, but there are things that we can do to help. Um, so going to the aroused um, situation, women not feeling properly aroused <clears throat> while making love, the, we spoke, I think, last week maybe on the yoni pH um, needing to be at about 6.5 for the sperm to survive inside the yoni. Um, that's not always the case, but and they can still survive, but it just really helps if we're aroused. So we go when we are aroused, we go from an acidity or from a pH of 4 uh, ish to 6, 6.5 ish. So um, that really, really helps making sure you're really, really aroused, really puffy, fully engorged before um, penetration. <clears throat> um, other things that can help is like eliminating the use of BPA um, plastic water bottles and food storage containers. Um, just being really mindful of anything that can change the hormones like that. Um, making love obviously in, in the fertile window <clears throat> really helps as well we'll go into foods um, that can help 
And let me just check my notes for this. Can I just add something <coughs> to that while yeah. you're checking your notes? Um, <coughs> sperm thrive in an alkaline environment. So when our yonis are, our yonis are naturally more acidic. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're trying to get pregnant, sperm really like an alkaline environment. So that's also something to, um, to make note of, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But if you are trying to get pregnant, what's good to get is uh, some pH strips to just test the acidity um, and the alkalinity of your, of your yoni. Mm -hmm. Just wipe it down there and take a look at the colors. And then you can look and see on the color coding on the strip package where if you're alkaline or if you're acidic. Um, so yeah, things that can can add to stress is poor diet and also uh, add to a, an acidic um, environment is poor diet and stress. So stress levels are also something that can be um, affecting your fertility. It's also really important to get um, a saliva hormone test done rather than a, a blood one, which is usually what the doctors prescribe. Um, like your, your general GP, unless they're really onto it, they don't really know that much about the saliva hormone testing, but it's amazing. It's the best thing that you can do if you're having any concerns over fertility or over your hormone, hormonal health in general. Another way to check fertility is where the cervix is inside the pelvic bowl. So when, we're, when we are ovulating, our cervix actually ra raises up high inside the pelvic bowl and it is more soft and open and then when we are not when we finish ovulating or before ovulation the cervix comes back down inside the pelvic bowl, bowl and it's more hard and feels like the tip of your nose and it's more closed so that's a really beautiful way to get in touch with your cervix and also to understand whether you're fertile or not and that might be everything to do with fertility um, from me and then going to contraception so um, there are a few different modes of contraception I'm just going to go through them here this is something I'm pretty passionate about so um, yeah I really love this topic because it's something that every single sister has to deal with <laughs> um, once we reach fertile and sexually active way, um, ages so there is the IUD, um, which can be copper or hormonal. Copper kills the sperm, hormonal changes our hormones, so we aren't having a proper cycle, um, meaning that we're not ovulating. Um, we have the hormonal, other hormonal contraceptions, which do the same, which is the contraceptive pill, Depo-Provera, and the Implanon, um, which all interfere with our natural hormonal processes. Um, we have the diaphragm, which sits up against the cervix, blocking um, the, cer the semen from entering in through the cervix. We have the female condom, which is the same as a condom, just it, it's bigger and goes inside us rather than over the top of a lingam. Then we have the condom, so those two are called barrier methods. Um, we have vasectomy and um, uh, tube tying or lynching or something, I actually don't remember the term for that. And then we have fertility awareness method. And then lastly, we have the rhythm method. Um, my favorite is the fertility awareness method. It's a new and improved version of the rhythm method. Unfortunately, it has um, a stigma associated with it that is um, like leftover of, um, of the rhythm method. So the rhythm method isn't so, um, success hasn't been so successful it's a really old method um, but again considering that we have um, irregular cycles and um, long a long fertile window the rhythm method pretty much is talking about okay so I, I menstruated here I'm gonna ovulate 14 days later that's when I'm that's when I'm um, I'm fertile so I won't have sex then I'm not taking into account the fact that our temperature changes, our cervical mucus changes, and our cervix changes in our body, um, which is what the fertility awareness method tracks. So it's tracking the temperature, it's tracking where our cervix is at, and our cervical um, fluid. And it's it's amazing. It's like it's a, now it's called the modern contraceptive. Like it's a really beautiful method, non-invasive. My second favorite is a vasectomy. 
Um, disectomies are super safe, quick, easy. They can be done in a doctor's chair. They're less expensive, way less invasive than a, than women get women getting a tube side. Something like ninety nine percent of the men that get it done are happy they've had it done, um, and it helps men male bodied individuals to have a say in contraception. Um, and in, to be involved. Um, it also takes the stress off the woman um, because even though, you know, hormonal contraceptives don't seem, aren't as invasive in one sense, surgically, um, the damage, the detrimental effects that it has on a woman are extremely invasive. And I saw a post the other day saying, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, we're kind of like guinea pigs and we're just kind of starting to see the repercussions I myself have had really um, severe side effects from going on um, oral contra hormonal contraception one called Yam uh, sorry Yaz and uh, or Yasmin or, or um, there's also one called Brenda that has the same components and um, yeah I highly recommend to stay as far away from those as possible there are now class actions in the States and Australia um, against the company because they had they did a whole bunch of studies, had really bad side effects and still went ahead and put, uh, let, let, um, it went to market. So, um, yeah, they, ha they can have extreme side effects, stroke, death, um, in my case, migraine, chronic migraines. Um, almost every sister that I talk to that has migraines and PMDD uh, is because they took Yaz at some stage in their life. I only took it for three months and it's been an 11 year process of getting my hormones back into balance and um, being able to live my life again. Um, so yeah, hormonal contraceptives. Some, some women, it works and they've been on it for years and years and years and it works and they're okay. Um, that being said, we don't know the long-term effects. That being said, we also don't know um, what we're testing for, what other problems that could be attributed to the pill that we don't actually know the link, um, such as autoimmune diseases that happen later on in life and um, infertility um, post, like once one sisters are coming off, um, coming off the contraception or, con or hormonal contraception, there, there's, there is a lot of infertility. Um, and not only that, we're completely out of sync with the cycles of life and our cycles with our body and um, understanding who we are and why we are the way we are um, as a woman or as a female bodied individual. So, yeah. Um, and so having that conversation around vasectomy with, uh, if you're in a heterosexual relationship with a male bodied individual is so worth having because it's something that's that's kind of like oh oh my god it's like crazy but it's actually just like a little nick in the testicle in the scrotum um they find the best difference there's a severance of the tie it's actually reversible so that's amazing like um yeah and then the fertility awareness method as well so amazing it's showing consistent um success rates so um yeah, I mean, and if oral contraception is working for you and you intuitively in your body feel like it's okay, like you've got a fucking strong constitution, you're going to be in line with the moon rather than a natural cycle, um, that's okay. But just being aware that the cycle isn't an actual cycle when we bleed, when we're on our oral contracep on hormonal contraception, it's not an actual real bleed. It's the body realizing it's not pregnant. And um, yeah. So just being aware of that, I don't want to advocate uh, hormonal contraception, but I also don't want to put anybody down that's on it or feels like they're in despair without it. So I'm um, just supporting your body through it, which Adrian might, might touch on. Yeah, that's everything from me. <laughs> I think that might have been a bit much. Sorry. I was, I was I started to giggle in, in the middle of that because there's one of our neighbors here is singing in the shower and I'm wondering <laughs> if you could hear it <laughs> so cute um I was wondering if we should share what our personal forms of birth control are yeah to everyone yeah sure I per I'm using a copper IUD right now well I have been for the past 10 almost oh, seven years seven years I was on the birth control pill for 15 years 
and it just really fucked my entire body up. It fucked up my gut health. I think it, I'm pretty sure, well, I know that it was one of the main reasons why I struggled with candida for so long and recurring yeast infection. So, um, but now I practice the method of abstinence. <laughs> Oh, but I really like my copper IUD a lot because I don't have to worry about remembering to take the pill. I don't have to worry about um, the hormonal effects on my body. And there are positives and negatives about having a copper IUD, yes, but for me it works. And um, every five years or so I get it replaced, or four years, every four to five years. And I just keep getting it checked out, making sure that the strings are in place, making sure that the IUD is in place because I've had a couple of scares, but um, just taking good care, making sure I'm listening to my body when something isn't right, getting getting it checked out if I need to, but that's what works for me. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So I use um, condoms when I first meet a lover, um, and then we both get uh, tested, and then if it's all clear, um, we... Um, go ahead with with using without using using the fertility awareness method. Um, if there if uh, if there is a case of genital herpes, then we figure out a way that we can make love when there's not an outbreak and and um, uh, and if there is something else, then we use a condom and and do partner treatment if and and my partner will do treatment or I'll do treatment if there's something. Um, if something comes up. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Okay, so it's my turn. <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, primarily fertility, uh, what to eat to help support and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Encourage fertility um, because contraceptive methods in terms of um, food, it's um, not as popular and it's not as, as strong and they're kind of older practices. So I'm gonna focus more on the fertility side of nutrition. Um, so fertility, I mean the things, I say the same thing every week. The things that you want to avoid if you're trying to get pregnant are avoid the bad shit. Just try to eat organic whole foods, healthy foods that are low in sugar, low in processed crap, and that, and try to avoid the inflammatory foods. So the gluten and the dairy and the sugar. That's the most important thing. Um, another thing to avoid if you're trying to get pregnant is excess caffeine and alcohol, because that just messes up with your gut health, messes your gut health, messes up the hormonal health. And if you're trying to get pregnant, you wanna try to keep your hormones in balance as much as possible. So that being said, some of the things that you want to focus on and you want to include in your diet are good fats, <laughs> got some noisy neighbors this morning so good fats like I say every week avocados nuts seeds salmon um, what else omega-3s to help regulate hormones and it increases the cervical mucus as well and helps to promote ovulation it also helps to improve the blood flow to the reproductive organs so good fats are really good so again extra virgin olive oil avocado uh, and nuts and seeds and salmon are really good sources. Um, another thing is antioxidants. So this can help also improve blood flow to the uterus. So like nuts, fruits, vegetables, whole grains um, are packed with things like vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, and zinc. So antioxidants are equally as important as good fats. Um, we've all heard, most of us have heard of making sure that when you're trying to get pregnant or that when you are pregnant, taking folic acid. So you want to uh, find foods that are rich in folate. So for example, um, foods like citrus fruits, beans, rice, and leafy green vegetables. Um, these are important, these, folate and, and folic acid is important for the health of your eggs. Um, and so it's more critical during the first few weeks that you're trying to conceive. So um, folate supports the brain, heart, and neural tube development in the baby and also helps to prevent pregnancy complications. So again, good fats, antioxidants, folate, and the last one is fiber. 
So you want to include a lot of really great and healthy fiber in your diet. And when you start eating these foods that we just I just talked about, that's going to be a natural source of fiber for you. So it's really important for digestion. It's really important to balance your hormones. It's great for your gut health. And you just want to maintain a really great overall balanced diet. Eating a big breakfast is also really important for women who are trying to get pregnant. So making sure that it's a balanced diet, including good fats, um, some kind of like a vegetable and carbohydrates. So it helps maintain your blood sugar and allows your endocrine system, which is what produces our hormones, to support your fertility throughout the day. <sighs> protein, healthy fats, and carbohydrates you want to include in your big breakfast. Um, some supplements that help improve fertility are maca and things that come from bees. So bee pollen and propolis are also really good for fertility. So, I, I, sorry to interrupt. I heard red maca is amazing for men with sperm count. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. Maca is good for both men and women. It's like the, it's like the fertility supplement of, I think it's from Peru. Um, so avoid inflammatory foods, like I mentioned. Avoid processed, refined carbohydrates. Avoid sugar. Avoid excess caffeine and alcohol. But also, equally as important, avoid um, high mercury fish. So mercury can be found in canned tuna. It can be found in any fish, actually. Sushi, I've heard a lot of women who are trying to get pregnant should avoid sushi. Um, it's just really toxic to the body and harmful to your hormone, to everything associated with um, fertility and with pregnancy. So that is the fertility part. Um, I hope that helps somewhat. Contraception, again, I would just, I'll just, highlight some of the, the things that I've, I know of, um, but I wouldn't recommend relying solely on diet and these foods for contraception um, because it's just not strong enough and everybody's different. And yeah, with in today's day and age, we have way better methods of contraception available. So um, some things that are good for contraception are papaya. It contains a really a special enzyme called papine which is responsible for um, contraception. But, um, what is it? You have to, it also has the um, property to reduce the production of female, female sex hormones that are responsible for conceiving. But again, like you'd have to eat a lot of papaya <laughs> or a lot of papaya seeds as well. Papaya seeds are also um, a contraceptive method or an old food that was a contraceptive method but again like you'd have to eat a lot of them over a long period of time to have any kind of functionality in terms of contraception so I would just just to be aware of it but I would not again use this as a primary source of contraception um, ginger as well is supposed to be a good method of contracep natural contraception because it stimulates menstrual blood flow um, and apricot is also supposed to be good because it prevents um, the fetus implantation. Cinnamon is also supposed to um, be known as for stimulating the uterus, causing miscarriage and abortion. But again, like you'd have to eat a lot of it over a long period of time. So um, parsley is also another one of them and neem as well. So just to give you an idea of, of the things that are available, um, and if you're interested, you can look into it a little bit more or you can work with a naturopath to um, find out what works best for you and if it's realistic for you, but just to give you an idea of some of the things that are out there. But um, I think it's more important to, when you're, if you're trying to get pregnant, really try to maintain the diet as best as possible, eating whole foods, organically sourced, good quality meats, protein is equally as important. Um, and make sure that you're taking really good care of yourself, getting lots of rest, paying attention to your cycles, knowing when you're ovulating, you know, have a, have a tracker, an app. There's so many apps that are available nowadays that are amazing mm. yeah, for tracking both our periods and our fertility. There's even like one that, you know, you can take your tem temperature and the pH strips and everything. Yeah. 
So there's lots of really great natural ways that you can um, sort of take care of yourself and your health if you're trying to get pregnant or avoid getting pregnant. So there's lots of options available to you. So that's me. That's my Thank part. You. Can I add with the yeah. contraception? Um, neem oil is supposed to be a really good spermicide. So mm, to, yeah. you can use that for, for a lubricant. It smells strong, um, but it's, it's something that you can have in your toolkit. Um, and then with the, the foods, um, you know, it's something that you can add to the FAM method, the fertility awa- awareness method, just for extra... Um, safety and also with um, emergency contraception um, there's the emergency contraception hormonal like a high progesterone pill Um, that's something that you might want to avoid Um, so these foods also come up on if you've had a if you've had a miss mishap um the foods that adrian just mentioned come up as foods that you can use like you said to avoid plantation um and in into the uterus of the egg and um the fertilized egg so yeah like you said parsley ginger cinnamon all of these things papaya hit it hard (laughs) hit it hard um there's also um dong kwai which is a really powerful herb Oh yeah, I did get some of her <coughs> other herbs as well. Yeah, so and um, that's these also things you want to obviously avoid once you have conceived. Um, mm-hmm. If you're wanting to be pregnant, stay really clear um, from these foods, um, and um, clary sage as well. You want to stay clear of that essential oil. Um, yeah. But that's a really good point because I've taken the morning after pill and it made me so sick Mm. because it's so strong. It's really strong. I mean... So you want to... That's what I was going to say about supporting... uh, If you're on hormonal contraception or taking any hormones ever, um, some different herbs um, and supplements to take to support your your system. Um, So you want to... Like vitamin B is really important if you're on hormonal contraception. Magnesium, really important if you're on a hormonal contraception. Zinc. Zinc. Um, and then if you have done like an emergency contraception hormonal one, uh, you, you'd want to go on a uh, chase tree for a little while to, to balance the hormones again, but just being aware that it makes you really fertile and it interferes with con- um, any other hormonal contraceptives. So, yeah to throw that in there. Yeah. I have a bunch of other herbs that are used for contraception, but I don't think they're worth really talking about because they're just so out there and you'd really need to like work with a practitioner to uh, know the certain amounts that you need to take and the dosages and stuff like that. So I won't even bother mentioning them, but um, yeah, like if you feel like you had an accident, you could potentially be pregnant there are options. I mean, you could go on the morning after pill, which for me, like I was in bed vomiting all day. It was just didn't work for me, but you can also try natural things like papaya and cinnamon and ginger and just taking a lot of it, parsley and neem. Um, a question about neem oil for the, the spermicide. Is it, is it okay and safe to put into the yoni? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So there's lots of options. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> okay. Great. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? On the chat? No questions so far? Okay. Looks like that's everything. Good. I hope that was informative and... At least a little bit entertaining with this guy singing in the background <laughs> in the shower. <laughs> He's happy. It's good. He's in Bali. <laughs> and there's all kinds of other noises of nature, children screaming. Welcome to our Yoni Talks, huh? <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining and tuning in to us. We do this every week. Um, next week we're going to be doing something a little bit different because my dear Kristen is leaving me for a week. She's going to go back to Australia for, for just uh, a week. Mm-hmm. So we're still going to be doing our Yoni Talks, but actually we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have a live question and answer. So 
if you have any questions, join us and ask anything that you like. We're super open, mm -hmm. as you know, <laughs> and we'll talk about anything. So if you have any questions, well, related to women's health, mm -hmm. let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, let's. <laughs> Uh, related to women's health. No cheeky us, business. No cheeky business. No cheeky business. Friends. Friends. <laughs> um, um, so we'll be mm. on live at the same time on mm. my, my, this time <laughs> next week, but we're going to be doing it a bit different where we'll have a live question and answer. Mm -hmm. um, so feel free to join us and ask any questions, and it's super informative for yeah. everybody because when we talk about it, we all learn. So. Yeah. Yeah, your question won't just help you, but everyone else that sees this, which is, you know, up to over a thousand. So. Yeah, and we keep it anonymous too. So if you have a question that's really personal, we don't share like who. Well, it comes up there. So you oh, it to, does. Yeah, it have you have to send a, a private message, which might be a bit tricky. So. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, maybe if if it's a really personal question, maybe you can make a fake account. And or join. if it's a really personal question, send us a message after, and we'll try our best to answer it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Mm -hmm. And um, you so if you missed half of this or just kind of caught us at the end, we're going to be posting this video as we do on our YouTube channels as well as our Facebook um, profiles. Well, I will. Yeah, we you too. And um, see you next week. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for Thank joining. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.